Happy Mum, Happy Baby is brought to you in association with Fisher-Price. Their innovative toys are designed to be loved by both parents and children at every age and stage, giving us a helping hand throughout our journey so that we can focus on the most important job in the world, parenting. Hello and welcome to another episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest, well, she's an author, she's a TV presenter, she's a columnist, and... She's my favourite winner ever of the Great British Bake Off. Yay. It's Nadia Hussain. Hello. Hi. <laughs> That's a nice long list. Gosh. Well, you, you seem to be adding to it all the time. I know. It's mad. Um, yeah. When I, whenever somebody kind of relays that list, I just think, where do I have a time to be a mum in between all of that? <laughs> but you're interested because you, you were a stay-at-home mum before yeah. Bake Off. Yeah. And, and actually, yeah, from what I've sort of been reading about you it's it seems like that is still at the heart of every, you would still call yourself that everything else is yeah. just on you know, the side if someone else if someone asks me what do you do I still say I'm a stay-at-home mom but I do other things as well <laughs> and it's really weird because like I feel I think I still feel like a stay-at-home mom because when I'm at home I like everything comes off and I'm just mum and that's yeah. it and in between all of that I'll write a little bit and test recipes and do other things but like my sole purpose is to be a mum and it I say that because I'm here today right now and like my mind is always somewhere else which mm-hmm. is like I think, like I look at the clock and I'm like oh he's back from school now and they're having dinner now and dad's heating it up really badly right now so <laughs> like I'm 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 going through their day in my head even though I'm trying to function by doing something else so I suppose I kind of, I suppose I kind of always will feel like a stay at home maybe I don't know maybe I haven't got that balance right just yet I don't think there is a balance I think it's something that is just out there that we're all looking for that is never actually there it's never actually going to be yeah fulfilled it's just that it's that I suppose it's that because I spent close to eight years with them yeah that's a lot of time when I think back at how little time I gave myself yeah um you know I had one I, I had my eldest and then I had my second and then three years later I had my daughter and I kind of felt like I had it all happened very quickly, and I was very young when I had my first. Yeah. So, so let's go. So you, um, you got married at nineteen. Yeah, 20? just turned twenty. Just turned twenty, an arranged marriage. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's a weird. Oh, really? It's a weird kind of arranged slash. We got to know each other for six months, but we never met. Okay. So we spoke to each other for six months, but we how did you write to each other, phone each other? T- t- those were the days of SMSs. Do you remember Ooh. when you could send pictures and they would load <laughs> little by little? Yeah. <laughs> What's it going to be? What's like, it going to oh, be? Oh, no. What's his face look like? It's like, oh, eyes are nice. Nice nose. Oh, no. Um, he had great hair. Um, <laughs> the first thing to load in every yeah, photo. Yeah, it was like he had lots of hair. So, um, yeah, so we spoke to each other for six months, but we, we, we didn't meet. So we, the first day we ever met was the day we got engaged. Right. And the second... Did you know that was going to happen that day? I think so, because okay. I quite liked him, and he had all the prospects of a good husband. Yeah. And, like... At 19, who asks, like, what's your 10-year forecast? But they were the right questions to ask because I was like, okay, so, like, he's got a good job and, like, he's passed his driving test so we can go out. And, I mean, and, and you know, when you're 19, you kind of just want to marry somebody who's good-looking, right? You just want... <laughs> and actually, you don't want to marry someone who's good-looking. You just kind of want to enjoy somebody who's yeah. good-looking, right? That's what I did. And I was like, yeah, he'll do. And, it, and he had a job. So I was like, well, that'll do. Uh, money and a good face. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And a car. I mean, well, what could you want? <laughs> Well, that's kind of what you want when you're 20. Yeah. I mean, ask me now and I'd say, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> um, but we spoke to each other for six months. And then the day we got engaged, that was the first time I'd actually seen him. And the day we got married was the second day I saw him. <laughs> and that was it. It's weird, isn't it? When you're just saying, I, even when I say it out loud and the look on your face, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's odd. But I didn't know about the six, because you had six months, of, uh, six months of courtship, really, yeah. because of you were getting to know each other. Yeah. But we'd never met and we didn't brave meeting. We're like, should we meet? Just, it, we Why just. Why not? Because uh, it, it was very, it was, our parents were quite strict. Like yeah. my parents were quite strict. And so it was just not, it wasn't a thing that we were going to do. And it just, if I did meet him, I'd have to lie to them. So I didn't want to uh, lie to okay. them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I just decided, no, actually it's best not to. But I got to speak to him for six months and got to know him. And, and turns out he's all right. Um, but how old were you when you felt pregnant? 20. 20. Yeah. So you must have fallen pregnant really quickly. Yeah. So I was pregnant. Within the first month and a half. Wow. Um, yeah, so it was expected. Like, we wanted to have a baby yeah. because it felt like we were just kind of doing... It was kind of... 
it sounds terrible and I hate saying it out loud, but it's the reality. It was tick box. It yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're married now and we didn't really know each other very well. Um, and yeah, I should have known the day we got married and I moved it, moved up to Leeds and, and there was no wardrobe space. <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> I should have known. But now, like, I have three quarters of the wardrobe That's space good. and he's got a tiny little sliver. <laughs> it was very tick box. It was we're married, let's have a baby and then and then we bought a house. So... Yeah, it was just, that's what we did. It was just very much kind of, this is what, isn't this what adults do? We were just adulting without realising that you know, there's there's a little bit more to it than yeah. just tick box. How did it feel to become, like, because I think when you're planning to become pregnant, yeah, but then the reality of actually being pregnant, how was that pregnancy? It was it was great. I mean, I, I could eat everything and I had, I mean, I had the first trimester, I had sickness, a little bit of, nausea but I was never actually physically sick so it was a lot of ginger nuts and flat coca-cola okay and preggy pops like those lollipops that are just lollipops but like they're meant to help you with sickness I've never heard have you never heard of them yeah well I had awful sickness but I wasn't actually I I wanted to physically be sick I was like come on just let it come out but it never came but I was just that feeling of nausea even down to the like my husband's you know like the smell that comes out of their nose <laughs> when they breathe right? don't breathe near yeah me. <laughs> so he would breathe next to me while we were in bed so I would make him turn around and sleep the other way around luckily he doesn't have smelly feet but I would rather look at his foot in the morning than smell him breathing I just thought the fact that this probably would have come around three months after marri- like I getting know. married and all of a sudden you're like no yeah exactly and we didn't even know each other that well was that difficult because I think being pregnant and having children even when you are in a long term relationship like me and Tom we were together a long time before we had kids yeah that's stressful anyway yeah and you know each other I think I, although saying that I think when you're pregnant you become a whole new person yeah in a weird way because your hormones and everything are all over the shop yeah I think I think that's why I became when I became a mother I think for me I'd I hadn't actually worked out how to be a wife yet. So it mm. kind of, everything was a little bit back to front for me. Um, and we did that whole tick box thing. Well, we've got to have a baby next and let's do that. And we did that. And we did a lot of learning about each other in that first year because we'd had our first wedding anniversary and then seven days later, our son was born. So oh. it was scary and weird at the same time because we almost didn't celebrate being together. And it was all yeah. about having a child. Yeah. So it's taken us that long, but you know, we're, on our 14th year now and you know now I can you know just two days ago we were watching television we binge watched Game of Thrones and we were watching the last little bit and he had his head like close to me and I was looking through his hair and he has got he's got more white hair than he has black and I had like I I, I was crying and he just why are you crying I just said I don't know you just got old (laughs) but I I couldn't believe that we've gone through 14 years and I've watched his hair go from black to grey and he's all salt, salt and peppery now. And it's yeah. really odd. And I was like, should we colour it? He's like, no, we're never going to colour it. <laughs> but I had this kind of weird feeling that, you know, I imagine that had I, we had that courtship and we'd got to know each other, perhaps I would have felt like that 14 years ago. But right. it's taken us that long, but we're there. Yeah. But we've done it. Everything about my marriage and my kids is back to front. Uh, and how long after your first child did you have your second? So I... Uh, it was exactly a year later. So, oh, really? So six days after my son's first birthday, my second son was born. <gasps> so it was literally as soon as we'd had it. Oh my gosh! You just literally like yeah, that was it. it was wham just, bam. Yeah. So we were we were having a conversation in the car, and my son, my eldest son Musa, was about well, seven or eight weeks old, yeah. and I just said, I think we should have another baby. He said, Okay, and that was it. And so we just got to it, and we had a second baby, and. Um, they say you're more fertile yeah, you, yeah, when, yeah. when you're breastfeeding. Yeah. So it was yeah, weird. Because it's that old wives' tale, isn't it? People think that you don't ovulate because you're breastfeeding, but actually you are more fertile. Exactly. So, I mean, I mean I'm sure he just looked at me and that was it, baby. <laughs> done. That was it. <laughs> just, it, it, it there, was, there was no effort required. It just happened. <laughs> he must have been a bit like, um... <laughs> Felt like a god. He was like, yes. <laughs> Oh, my God, so that does mean, though, that the majority of your first two years together... Yeah. ...you were pregnant the whole time. The whole the time, majority of it, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was... I remember when I had my first son, it was really... Because um, I, I remember having him and being pregnant with him, and I said to my husband, like, I want something that's mine. Because I'd moved... 160, I was 165 miles away from home, so yeah. my parents were in Luton. I moved to Leeds to live with him. And, you know, they... I could barely understand what they were saying. So I hadn't heard a northern like accent till I... Really? Because he was from Leeds. Yeah. So he had a really strong 
northern accent, which both my boys still have a strong northern accent really? and my daughter doesn't anymore. But there's, you know, and I, I like it. I like a northern accent, mm. clearly, because yeah. it just, it, I just, it just sounds so good. Um, but we moved up and, and, I suppose I wanted something for me. And I think having a child meant he was mine. And I then, like, I had something that was my own. And, I mean, I could have got a cat. <laughs> In hindsight. I mean, it could have got, yeah, 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 probably a little bit easier and cheaper. But yeah. I just wanted something that was mine. And I yeah. remember after he was born, I felt sorry for him because I felt like he had nobody apart from me. So I said, let's have somebody for him. And so this is, <laughs> so that's that was my reasoning. It's like, yeah. But if you think, if I think back now, I'm 34 years old. I was 21. Mm. Like my, I mean, logic hadn't even set in then. You know, I hadn't lived. You know, I didn't know anything really yeah. when I think back now to the things that I know now. Like, what did I know at 21? I hadn't lived. I hadn't traveled. I hadn't seen much of the world. And, you know, I was there in this house, pregnant yeah, you know, with a husband. I didn't know that well. And it was kind of, it was scary. Is it a big culture thing as well? Like, is it is it a, is it a common thing for people to get married young and to start families young? Absolutely, it's something that I've grown up with, so it was completely normal to do it. But I've I've never heard the I've never actually heard the other side of what it's like to be married. So mm. to be in those shoes in that position, I kind of stepped back and thought this is harder than it looks, yeah. you know, because I've seen lots of cousins and relatives go off, get married, move out of that, um, you know, move out of their parents' houses and. They have these arranged marriages and some not arranged yet, you know, they made it look effortless. But, yeah. you know, were they suffering quietly alone as well? Because I know that it wasn't easy for me. And with somebody who suffers with, you know, mental health issues, it wasn't easy. And so and I hadn't told my husband that I suffer with panic disorder. So that was a that was something that I perhaps should have shared with mm. him. And so then there was a mixture of being a wife and being a mom and then, you know, having another baby. And so we had two babies very quickly and that, of course that put a lot of pressure on our marriage it, yeah. was, it wasn't easy at all because we were just getting to know each other um, so that was a point when after I had my second son I was like I think maybe no more babies for a little <laughs> while and and you know it, it took me two years to get there yeah yeah but did you you have a big family growing up as well, didn't you? Yeah, I'm one of six. Yeah. I'm one of six. Uh, my dad's one of 14. Wow. My mum's one of, originally eight, but she lost four brothers and sisters, so she's one of four, which is very small. Yeah. Um, my husband's one of seven. So these are normal numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like one of 14. That is crazy. When I mean, my grandma died in her early 50s, and I, I'm telling you it's just because she had 14 <laughs> kids. It has to be. Yeah. Why else did she die in her 50s? It's just... It just well, when... So having having had people like that in your family who are all from big families, big families are everything, uh, when you were looking at your future, how many children do you think you would have? I mean, I originally, I remember saying that I didn't want to have children. Oh, really? Yeah, because it's really noisy. You know, just like when I was... You know, when you're... I only ever think, if I think about, because when growing up, it wasn't just you and your family. Was, I was one of six, but yeah. we had extended family. So every cousin that would come over, they'd come in fives and sixes. And, <laughs> and so it got really crowded. And so I remember being 15 and doing my uh, revision for my GCSE and not finding one spot in the house where I could just do my revision. I remember thinking to myself at that point, I don't think I want to have kids because wow. this is just, it's mayhem. Yeah. Um, and I hated it. And I remember saying to myself, if I've ever found the right guy, I would have children, but not if I didn't find the right guy. But I didn't know whether he was the right guy. Was so, there a lot of expectation to have children? Oh, I mean, I mean about four weeks in, everyone was asking, are you going to have kids yet? Are you going to have kids yet? <laughs> I don't know. Part of me regrets not enjoying being married um, and enjoying my husband and really getting to know him before mm. having children. But I think that having them so early, it changed our dynamic in our home and and I think it I think it solidified our relationship as husband and wife really early on without realizing what we yeah. were doing I think it was I think we got very lucky coming from a big family did you did you feel a lot of support going like through your pregnancies and, and in the early days of having a baby it, it's it's odd isn't it there's this thing about being pregnant and I think women are quite competitive and and also you have to remember when you're pregnant you're also highly sensitive yeah so anytime anyone would say something to me, I would feel like that was a, like a direct dig, dig straight yeah. into my heart. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't know anyone who had had babies apart from my sister. But she was this, and still is, this tiny little like size zero 
petite, like she has a baby and then she just, she's in Tesco two hours later and she's got a six pack six weeks later. And I'm like, right. how? And for me, that's what I imagined. I was like, well, she's my sister. Mm. Surely I'm going to be just like her. We've got the same genes. Exactly. You know? Genetically, we're yeah. the same. So surely I'm going to be just like her and I'm going to zip back into shape and I'm going to be in Tesco two hours later. And I was the complete opposite. And I can't, I, 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 can, I remember constantly comparing myself to her. Thinking, really? How come you, she had tiny little babies and, you know, her labours were not long or drawn out and, and she could, she had the energy to be mum. Mm. And for me, I had the complete opposite. I put on three stone and <clears throat> I was in a, I, actively in labour for 72 hours wow. um, to the point where, you know, they, they couldn't, his heartbeat had dropped, um, heart rate had dropped and they said, right, we're going to have to go C-section and then literally within that point and them saying that, and realizing he was out, he just oh, really he just flew out, causing the most damage, the most damage. Oh my goodness! Do you have stitches? Yes, fourth degree tear. Oh. Stitches. I'm telling you, and I tell him. I say I'm going to tell him. Hold everyone. on a minute. Yeah. You. And yeah. then you fell pregnant seven weeks later. Yeah. Nadia. Yeah, I know. <laughs> chainsaw <laughs> you'd think that would be like the biggest form of contraception don't go near exactly. me for two years please but apparently women are conditioned to forget pain yeah, and that's yeah. why we're so good at it it's because if we remembered pain then we would never have a second child yeah. so i'm you know i'm glad i didn't but because yeah. of that you wouldn't have been able to walk I, I imagine walking around and doing anything no so well you know what i used to do i used to go to the local like What's that shop? Farm Foods, yeah. So yeah. I used to go down to Farm Foods and my husband used to go down and he would get ice lollies and then we'd freeze them and we'd stick them in oh, my yeah, pants yeah. for relief. Yeah. And, it, I mean, it would last. I'm, I, it was like a volcano, honestly. It was shocking. But it, they would last for all of about 10 seconds. I'm like, give me another <laughs> one. It's melted so quickly. <laughs> And there I was, ice lollies. And, and my husband said, should we just wash these and put them back in the freezer? I'm like, I don't know. What's the right thing to do? Do we recycle? We've never done this before. <laughs> you should have gone to recycling. And then he was like, well, I? I was like, I don't know. I remember having this conversation two days in. And I was like, I don't know what the right thing is to do. Is it clean to put that back in there and wash it? And he said, come on, have some patience. I said, shut up. I've just had a baby. Don't tell me to have patience. I don't know what to do. And it was so stressful because I couldn't sit. Yeah. I couldn't lie down. And when I did lie down, I couldn't get back up. And I remember coming home with him and he was eight pounds eight. So he's a big mm -hmm. boy. Yep. Um, and I remember my mom and I was so lucky like to have my mom for that first week was the best thing because I think as a grow as, as you grow up, you appreciate your mom the most yeah. when you become a mum yourself mm -hmm. because you realise what your body's just done and, and, and that you have a different appreciation for your mother. Yeah. And so now, after that point, every birthday of mine, I always give her Aww. a present. So it's nice for her because she gets six every year now from all <laughs> of her kids. But that's, you know, I definitely had a different appreciation for my own mum because she came in and she literally swept in and, and, and took over. Really? Which was the best thing. That's all anyone can ever want is for someone to just come in and say just you do the bare minimum and let yeah. me do the rest and I was I remember coming in and having not slept for 72 hours and my husband was so tired he nearly drowned in the bath he was so sleepy um, and he can never ever eat another Rocky bar ever again because he, <laughs> he'd packed 12 and he'd eaten all 12 and you can't, he can't if, if I say Rocky bar this is going to make him sick by the way <laughs> Ooh, I can't do that um, but my mum came in and she I remember the first night um, he was in his basket and he was crying hysterically. Obviously he needed feeding and mm. I didn't have a clue. And my mum just, my mum came in and kind of nudged me and said, can you not hear him crying? I couldn't, I didn't hear, because really? I suppose that thing didn't kick in. You know that instinct that yeah. you expect to kick in straight away where if your child even like just makes a coo, then you just know exactly what that coo's about. Um, it hadn't kicked in whatever that was that I was waiting for. It didn't happen. And I just said, well, I didn't hear him. And and then she said, well, look, I, I'll make him a bottle. You rest and then we can get him on breastfeeding a little bit later. Let's just give him a bottle just to get him to get him settled. So she did. And through the whole night, I had no idea that she had him. She'd literally taken the Moses basket, taken it into her room <laughs> and fed him through the night. And I hadn't realised that she'd done that. But I was so tired. But also probably for you, getting that asleep. I needed it. Yeah. It, just, it was... It was just the weirdest, most surreal situation to be in. And I remember saying to my mum, so mum, 
So this is going to take me a little... I could, it turns out that I didn't know I was going to have these stitches and, and they're going to take a while to heal. So I was like in salt baths and, and, and what nobody tells you is that like you can't go for a wee because it, oh, it's the, the most stitches. Oh. painful thing. It's like having a chainsaw down there. Or number there. two. Oh, Anything. That was the, that was the dreaded number mm-hmm. two. That Just anticipating yeah. it was scary. Um, and I remember the doctor saying that if you want to go for a wee, just sit in a bath and do it in the bath. Oh, really? Then it doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was doing that. But every time I needed a wee, I was running a bath. And so I was <laughs> in the bath. I was in the bath constantly. So I was having conversations with people from the bathtub all day. I was breastfeeding in the bathtub. Um, but you you just, you're never prepared. You're never, no, pre- you, no one ever prepares you for what's to come. And, and, and that's when I learned, actually, just because my sister had that pregnancy doesn't mean that I'm going to have the same. And, you know, my sister after me, she had a C-section and couldn't have her children naturally. Mm. So, like, we're completely different. So I suppose expectation is, I think, mother of all evils, isn't it? Well, I think it's really easy to look at someone and go, oh, my God, she's done that that way. And But there might be other things that you didn't see with your sister behind closed doors that you just weren't, yeah, you know, privy to. Yeah. You don't, because you, it's it's very private. It's something that, you know, a part of me wishes that I had gone in there and seen what it is that she went through. Because I remember my sister coming back and saying, 72 hours, she goes, I can't, you have, she goes, you have had us all on edge for the last few days because... We, <laughs> Turning it back on them. Yeah, we have, we, so have, we, have so, we have suffered. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> they were so, they were stressed out. And I remember feeling really bad. I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I kind of thought that he would just come out and he didn't. Um... And you can imagine the horror when I told him three months later, two months later, that I was pregnant again. I'm like, what? I mean, that's that's brave. That's a bold move. Yeah. And he was the and, and he was it was a much easier labour and much easier pregnancy. So yeah. for, the doctor said, if you're gonna do it, do it now. Don't wait too long. But oh, really, yeah. But he, when I when I told him I was pregnant, she said, okay, I didn't mean that soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have specified. <laughs> <laughs> but as you got closer to the second uh, birth, did you feel anxious at all knowing what had come before? Well, I had, you know when you have that birth plan for the first one? Yeah. I had it all typed up, <laughs> I had it laminated in did case you? of spillages, <laughs> yes, absolutely, I still have it. Um, I had it laminated just in case and yeah. I had a copy for my sister and a copy for my husband, so I was like, everybody will know straight out the window. It didn't go as you know, how I imagined it would. And yeah. I didn't even get to... The one thing I wanted was to have him on my chest straight away. Right. And I couldn't do that because I was in such a bad way that he was on his dad and I didn't really, really? get to touch him for a couple of hours. Um, so it didn't go to plan. So the second time round, and and I reckon our midwife fancied our husband, my husband really? a little bit. Yeah. I reckon she had a thing for him. 72 hours later, I mean, you could fall in love in 72 hours. I know. <laughs> you do know. I do. So t- I know. So, like, 72 hours later, they had become really good friends. And she kept, Did like... Did you feel out of the loop a little totally bit? Totally third wheel. Third wheel. And he, she was, like, all, oh, and, like, touching his shoulder and tapping his wrist. And, and she was going in for hugs. And I was, like, kind of looking over. I was like, am I disturbing you guys here? But there was... And and I and she walked out. I said she loves you, and it's like she doesn't love me. Don't be ridiculous. And and there was and there was definitely like you could see she did she did like him a little bit. Um, good looking man though. I mean he's all yeah, right. Yeah, I mean he he's is, not he he's is, easy yeah. on the eye. So you know it's it it was it was gonna happen. Um, but that was but this time right. But every time I said oh but I can't I can I can you can I have a little bit of help moving over? She'd roll her eyes a little bit and 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 toss me over the other side because I remember feeling really. Um, I felt like a nuisance. Really? I felt like a total nuisance when I was having... Because I was still only a kid myself, yeah. really. And so all I wanted was to be... I wanted to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. And I rem- nurtured through it almost, yeah. you know, guided. Yeah, and, and I, I remember just kind of... Like when you're at a hospital, you expect to be looked after and, mm. and uh, you expect to be cared for. And I think I felt like a nuisance because... I could kind of kind of remember her looking at her watch, thinking, "Come on, she's still." I, she did her shift, left her shift, and came back, and I was still there. Right. So she was like, "When is she going to have this baby and leave?" So I think she was getting fed up of me, and I was kind of getting fed up of her as well. And she just she had weight. The relationship with my husband was just too comfortable. I was like, "No, get rid of her." Um, but second time round, didn't do a birth plan. Right. I just said, "As soon as the baby's born, I wa- I'd like him on me." if it goes to plan, yeah. that was it. I was like, I don't have a plan. Let's see what happens. So I think 
I'd already because I I knew I knew what to expect, which was not to expect anything yeah. because I don't know what the second pregnancy was going to be like. And the the midwife said, "Oh, it'd be a lot easier. It's your second child, and you've had him so soon after, so it'd be absolutely fine." I didn't believe her either. I was like, "Well, I'm, <laughs> the best thing is to have no expectations yeah. whatsoever." So I went in with zero expectations, and the midwife definitely didn't fancy him that time around. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> no chemistry. No chemistry there. I was in and out. I was in and out. That was fifty two hours. Oh, really? And to me, that was in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it crazy to think that you'd only known each other, or by then you'd known each other a year? Yeah. And seeing, because I think it's hard to see your partner go through childbirth anyway. Yeah. But to see someone who is, you're still getting to know each other. Was it, was it strange for you seeing him see you in that way? Yeah. Was I, a part of you still, you know? I think I appreciated him more as a, I think my love for him definitely grew when I, could appreciate what kind of a dad he was. Because mm. at that point, I think there was, I remember having, I mean, I know that he loved me and I, I, I loved him in a way, I suppose. It, it And it wasn't that kind of, it was like, I was neither here nor there. It was just like, I do love you, like you love people, but because he was my husband and I was having his kids. So there's yeah. a love there, but it wasn't that like now, I couldn't live without him. Mm. There is, there I can't see a world without him. Back then, I was like, mm, yeah, give or take. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. I don't know. Um, and he's going to hate me. He's going to hate me for being that honest. But it was. Yeah. It was. Um, it doesn't mean to say I didn't love him. I just didn't love him the way I love him now. And that's yeah. very different. Um, but I think when you watch a human push another human out of their body mm. and it's yours, like that is... Powerful. That's powerful mm. because... There was a time when, you know, men wouldn't go into a room with their wives. Well, like your mum and dad, or, would that have... No. No, I think dad... I think at the very beginning, for a couple of the births, dad was there. And I think by the time you get to, like, child four, you're like, all right, just <laughs> cigarettes, <laughs> going for a fag, <laughs> seeing a bit. <laughs> he did. With me, he, he was going out for a fag while mum was in labour. Really? And then I was born, and then the midwife ran up to him and said, she just had the baby. So, <laughs> okay. He goes, well... All right, well, let me just have my fag and I'll be Come back. I've a couple of drags left. I'll <laughs> yeah. be in a second. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's scary to go that far back. Yeah. How did you feel when you had your first child play? Well, because well, you had a couple of hours sort of preparing. Mm -hmm. When you actually met your son, how did it feel? It was odd because I remember... Because I, I had that plan in my head and in my head I was going to touch him first. Mm. So... Even to this day, I kind of hold slight... Uh, a little bit sad. Just a little bit, because I wanted to touch him first. Yeah. I was like, I get that you're his dad, and it's okay that one of us touches him first, but I did kind of kind of hold him. Like, he was in me, yeah. and, and and that what I think... Because he'd held him, and I remember him being really calm at first, and then he weed on his dad, and he had, like, weed down his T-shirt. And then after they were repairing me, he just kind of held him, not knowing what to do because he hadn't really held that many babies. So it's kind of holding him. And then he started to cry hysterically, obviously hungry, which now I know my son, like he's always hungry. <laughs> um, he was hungry and he needed feeding. And whatever it was, he was crying and he couldn't settle him. Mm. And there was something about that moment when he was crying and they lifted up my top and just stuck him straight in. And I will never forget the the that silence, that instantaneous silence from the moment he's crying to being here Ooh, and listening he to my heartbeat. Yeah. And he stopped, like, oh. straight away. And that, that makes me want to have another baby. Just it talking it. about it makes me want to have another baby. Um, but that moment when I put him on and he just stopped straight away and I and I looked over at my husband and he goes, it's because you're his mum. And, oh. and that moment for me was, I'll never forget that moment because, like, I remember moving away from home and not having my family around, something that I was so used to, and not having my parents, not having my sisters, and then suddenly I had what was mine, like he was mine. Yeah. And I think I look at my kids and I can't guarantee anything in the world, but they're mine, you know, they yeah. are mine. And, and they won't be mine for long because I always say there's gonna be a moment oh. when I give you up to the world and you'll be the world's. You're not going to be mine forever. But for that moment, he felt like mine. And sometimes I hold him even now. And I, I describe that moment when he heard my heartbeat. And sometimes even now, he'll just lay there. And I'm like, do you remember that time 
when you were crying and then I put you on my chest and you stopped crying and and he'd say yes I remember I'm like because he thinks it's his memory now <laughs> and I was like he goes yes yes I remember I remember when when I stopped crying right ma and I was like yeah that's it and 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 he to him that's a memory but it's only because I tell him that story but yeah. suddenly you know that pain that being stitched up yeah and like they were poking and prodding and like I remember seeing blood just dripping down the side of my bed and there was a massive puddle I remember looking over and and he'd stopped crying and I looked over and I was like where's that blood from <gasps> and that was that moment and, and he looked at me and he, and then I was like I think I might drop him because I just got oh, all like really? weird and I fainted don't oh, remember no. what, yeah then I don't remember what happened after that I was like, can you take him? Because I don't oh, oh. I love it. That Gone. really tender, emotional moment. <laughs> tender to you fainting. <laughs> take him off, take him off, take him off. And then got rid. And I was like, I don't really know what happened after that. And then I think I was in and out a little bit after that. And yeah. it, was quite, it was quite stressful. Well, you've been through 72 hours and it sounded like it was quite... Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, quite an experience. It's only when the painkillers wear off. Mm. And then realizing that like every time I breastfeed him it hurts because oh, yeah. your it's your Everything uterus up, doing yeah. that thing where it's like contracting contracting yeah. and I was like this shouldn't hurt why does this hurt it shouldn't hurt this is meant to be like the most amazing thing in the whole wide world and my mom's like it'll be fine it'll be fine and um I remember a relative coming over to see the baby and saying oh do you still look pregnant I was like I haven't had him I've only had him like 24 hours ago yeah what do you mean I still look pregnant and it's all of those things. I remember those things. Did that did that that sentence stay with you? Yeah. For I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it right now in this moment if it hadn't. Because yeah. I remember, I I was like, why would you say that? Because then what was I doing? I was like this massive, like what felt. It feels it's weird, isn't it? That yeah. feeling because there's no baby under like there. Doughy. But yeah, but it's huge. Mm. Like bread when it when it when yeah. it has its first proof yeah. and I'm like oh but it's supposed to deflate why doesn't it deflate and it's just there yeah um but then you kind of it's kind of the perfect little pouch to to put your to rest, fi- them, to on. rest them on it is i think it, i think it's nature's way of saying that like it's meant to be there it's like nature's pillow isn't it yeah when you're feeding it's kind of like the perfect mound yeah. to sit your child on so did the first pregnancy make you uh, approach the second pregnancy any differently? I think because I had such a young baby, mm. um, it was almost, you couldn't even, I hadn't even told anyone that I was pregnant because really? for the fear of ju- being judged. Really? Yeah, so for the first uh, three and a half, like normally at about 10, 12 weeks, I would have said something, but I kind of kept it quiet till somebody worked it out. And then I was starting to feel really sick and I was like, oh, somebody's going to work this out now. Yeah. Um, but I was scared that people were going to judge me that. Who would judge you? Um, I suppose I didn't want to be the... Maybe I was judging myself. Maybe yeah. I didn't want to be the mum who... That's where I think a lot of judgment, actually, in parenthood comes from. It's ourselves. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think I think I was slightly judgmental of myself. I think I didn't want to be the, the you know, the young 21-year-old who's just, like, my only purpose in life is just to have kids. And I just didn't want to seem like... I don't know. I think I was more judgmental. I think I was the one that was judgmental, not anyone else. I was scared that people would judge me if I told them that I was pregnant. But I did. Eventually, it, I was too sick to not say something. Um, but weirdly, having my son around was such a big distraction because while I was pregnant and feeling sick, I had no choice but to get up. And, and, and they need you quite a lot when they're three months old, four months old. You know, nappies need changing. You know, there's, you know, when the poo goes right up their back and, you know, you can't worry about, <laughs> no. your, 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 you know, having a sore back or feeling sick. You just got to get on with it yeah. and like get them in the bathtub and get them washed. Um, you just do, don't you? You just have to get on with it. And I think a lot of my pregnancy went, that second pregnancy was a blur because... Was, was there any point though that you, that you sort of had the poo up the back and your, and your, your own back was aching where you were a bit like, what have I done? No, 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 really? I, no, no, because no, I remember thinking that the third time round. <laughs> really? Yeah, third time round, because weirdly, you just like, you just get on with it. It's like mm. mum mode. And yeah, I just, yeah. just did it. And I'm not good at, I'm not very good at failing. So when I, when I start something like my children are my mission and they mm. always will be. Um, and I always say that. And that sounds, that sounds like very the, that's like the least mum type thing to say is like they are my mission but ultimately my job is to create 
three beautiful children that I get to give back to the world. Yeah. And and that's what's important to me because they won't be mine forever. They're not my property. I don't own them. But, you know, I did make them. And so that's something that I have that responsibility at least till they're 18, until they go off and do their own thing. So, no, I think the moments where I, I never felt regret yeah. because I was too busy Doing trying it. to do the best job mm. with the one that I had. And, you know, he was, you know, you want to be... I, I never had anybody to compare him to, but I wanted him to know every single colour. And I wanted him to know his numbers. And I wanted him to know every song on CBBS before he goes to bed. And he he was just like, he was, and he was so easy to look after. He was so, he would eat on time. He'd sleep on time. And I'd, uh, we'd have, we'd ha- he was in his own cot when he was four months old, in his own room. And I didn't have to like lull him to sleep. Yeah. It was just get in, give you a little teddy bear and then just, off to sleep, turn the lights off, that's it. And he was just such an easy baby. And I always say that, and my husband always says, you realise he wasn't just an easy baby, you were actually a good mum. And I was like, no, 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 he was an easy baby, he was really good. He must have been really calm. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we, we, he was my own, he was kind of my kid and my friend at the same time, because I didn't have friends. Yeah. And so we used to do... Because well, you'd moved the area. You'd yeah, come. so I was like nearly 200 miles away from home. I didn't. Yeah. I hadn't made any friends. Um, and I recently learned about like a, a baby group and I'd taken him to this baby group and I didn't make many friends there. And Why didn't you make friends there? I, I just think, I don't know. I just think, I don't, I don't think I was ready for friends. I think I was still mourning the fact that I'd left all of my friends yeah. behind. And so I wasn't ready to make friends just yet. But And it can be quite overwhelming, I think, when you first step into a, a, a like a baby group because yeah. you, you want to be a part of it. But at the same time, you kind of, feel like you're on the outside because of all the things that you're going like that are going on that you feel like you're the only one going through yeah and and like everyone knows when you're in there everyone knows where they need to go to make a cup of tea but you're kind of there like i don't know where i'm going and just you feel you feel like you're on the outside yeah. so it takes a little while to get into that and 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 the play group the lady that ran the play group was lovely and so she would kind of like come on come on and integrate us in and a little bit and it helps when you've got little kids because actually they talk to everyone and then yeah. you get to chatting anyway so um but you know, we used to take him to the. I used to take him to this group, and you know, and and my whole world revolved around looking after him mm. and making sure everything was perfect and making sure that he was in bed on time because he was a mark of my achievements. You know, at this point, at twenty one, the only thing I'd achieved was having a child, and you know, I I couldn't have done that if I didn't have him. So he was my. He was he was the. Every time I he achieved something, it was like for me another achievement. So yeah. when he was going to bed by himself, and when he was eating all his food, and you know when he learned how to chop a carrot, you know all of those things, you know, they were a mark of my achievement. So so he had a lot of pressure, poor thing. It's quite yeah. a lot of pressure for a one year old. <laughs> yeah. How did it? How did things change adding another baby into the mix? That was quite interesting actually, because we were really afraid that he would hate him. Yeah. Um, and. He was a day, he was a year and six days old when when my second son was born. He was in hospital and my little boy had a heart murmur. Oh. And so he had, we had to keep him back and um, he came to meet his brother, but we were in a, in a different ward and they were having his heart checked. And I remember, because we've got lots of heart problems in our family, right. instantly we thought, oh no, what's going on? And everybody was very worried. And then they... It was weird because, like, for me, I saw this baby, but he was, to me, he was he was sick. And mm. I, I have a brother and sister who were born sick, and they spent a lot of time in hospital. Right. Like, sometimes nine months of the year was in hospital. And, and my, we didn't see much of our parents. My grandma looked after us, so they were in and out of hospital between, like, different parts of the country. So I saw him, and he had this, they said he's got this heart murmur, which, you know, so it's, like, effectively a hole in his heart. So... I kind of looked at him and thought, oh my goodness, it's history repeating itself. This is this is me, I'm going to be my mum. And I remember looking at him thinking, that's all I could see. Like my beautiful baby boy, but I could see that. I could see yeah. my mum's life. I could see, you know, what we went through. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is my son. This is it. I'm, I am my mother. And um, it's weird. And then in that moment, he, his brother comes in. My my husband was carrying him. He's only a year old. He built like a tank. He was huge. <laughs> what about food? Huge. I, I remember his friend picking him up. My husband's friend picking him up and saying, do you feed him bricks? <laughs> He's so heavy. Um, and he came in and all he did was like, he kind of walked up to him and then he just poked him in the eye. <laughs> and then he made him cry and he looked at me and he was like, 
baby cry and I was like yeah baby cry and that moment like we I was like you think once you've had one child that you're a family but actually now when I look at like that moment where we just suddenly became some, we became something else we mm. morphed into something else entirely and to him that was just his brother and I could as an adult head I could see all the other things that could possibly happen to our family but in that moment we were just we were just a family mm. and to this day I always ask him how did you meet him because I don't remember because they don't know because they're yeah. only a year apart so it felt like having twins so he'd lucky for me my elder sister started walking at nine months right which meant that I didn't have to lug two around oh, of course so imagine having yeah. to lug the two around so um but you know we also entered into the world of double buggies which nobody <laughs> likes a parent with double buggies is all I'm saying nobody likes a double buggy mum the looks and, and we didn't we didn't even have the ones they, they were very modern the ones now where you have the one tucked underneath like the yeah. shopping you know you have one mm-hmm. kid that's the shopping well, that freaks me out <laughs> like who do you choose the least favorite goes in the bottom or well, they don't see the world because they can only look in one direction yeah. <laughs> who gets to be the shopping with the onions here you go yeah. here you go kid have the onions and then the one at the top yeah. so we hadn't like we didn't have the money for anything like that so mm. we had these like like you could like it, the, cheap Okay, it was, so it was cheap, but it was side by side. Yeah. So I was the double buggy mum who was like knocking everybody around and I was shopping on the side. Um, and it, yeah, just for him, you know, he doesn't see that. He didn't see that. He just saw his brother. Yeah. Um, How long did you have to stay in hospital for with his heart? Just a day, really? just a day. But they sent us, they sent us home afterwards and said, he, I mean, you just keep an eye on him, make sure that his lips don't go blue and keep an eye on his breathing. And we had to wait six months for an appointment just to check because they have to give it six months before... Because the heart develop. So some kids, you know, the heart develops and then the hole can get... They can, the hole naturally will close. And we had to wait six months and that was the hardest six months because that was in, my, in the back of my head the whole time. Just mm. every time I looked at him, every I spent those six months just constantly checking that he was alive. Because every time I'd go up to his Moses Vars, I was just fear the fear that he wouldn't be alive in there. Yeah. And so I sent, spent six months just keeping an eye on him, making sure that he was alive. And, and it became hab- such a bad habit that even my eldest son was going up and, and, and checking. Really? And yeah, he would go up and he'd say, he'd call him, he called him Adu. I was like, Adu? And I was like, yeah, come on then. And so he would, because I would check him and then he would go and check him and he would just do what I was doing, which was just checking and like having a little poke. Yeah. And he would have a little poke and then he'd come back and he, he was just doing what I was doing. But the, they were really tricky six months because it was just there. You forget sometimes, but it's there in the back of your mm-hmm. mind. Not sure. Um, but luckily six months later, uh, we went back and I had an appointment and they said he's absolutely fine. And I remember just crying with relief. And you know those... um you know the, the the paper towels they have on the on the beds to keep yeah. them clean? Well, I just like, ripped a load of that off. And I remember just sitting there with that on my face because <laughs> I was crying so much because it was a really hard six months. Even yeah. though I think about the fact that we just carried on and got on with it, I remember six months of just spending that six months just checking that he wasn't dead. Um, Did that really pull you together as a family as well? Oh, absolutely. I, I think... You can't, I think it does pull you together, but you also just get on with it. Mm. I think when you have nappies to change and bills to pay and, you know, loans to pay back and mortgage, you just, you just get on with it. And I think that was what it was. It wasn't us pulling together. It was us getting on with life. Mm. And I think there was a moment when my second son, um, he had, um, he, he had, he hadn't been diagnosed, but he had symptoms of asthma. And I remember him being, uh, so he was seven months old. So this is a month after we'd got the all clear for his heart. And he was crawling. And I remember him crawling and then just t- kind of a couple of crawls and then laying down. And then a couple of crawls and then laying down. And his brother's patting on the couch and saying, come on, come with me, come and sit down. But he couldn't make it. Maybe, I think it was about two metres. He mm-hmm. couldn't go two metres without stopping every few movements and then stopping. I was like, something's not right with him. And I kind of flipped him over and he'd gone limp and his face had gone blue and his lips had gone blue and and he couldn't breathe and he was just shallow and something wasn't right and I could, he just wasn't right. And I remember just calling an ambulance because I didn't have a car. I didn't have the car and I called an ambulance and um, I remember just kind of like, Musa didn't have his shoes and Dawood was limp in my arms and I'm like talk to him let's talk to him keep talking to him 
And then the ambulance came and we sat in the car, in, in the ambulance. And I remember he's kind of just, he's really, my eldest Musa is sat there and he's really excited by the noises yeah. and, and looking at the little tubes and things. And, and in that moment, I didn't care that he didn't have shoes on or what he did. Yeah, it was just yeah. like, I don't actually, right now, this does not matter. You just, whatever. And I remember paramedic just kind of picking him up and taking him into the into the ambulance. But there I am with my son and he was just, um, he was breathing, but he was just not himself. And, and I, I knew something wasn't right. And that's when I think truly instinct kicked in because I knew that morning when he woke up, he didn't look right to me. And, and it's a sign because the inside of his mouth had gone bright red. Right. And now, even now, when he gets sick, the first thing I see is the inside of his mouth. And I'm like, he's not well. I know he's not sick. And my husband always says, he's fine. <laughs> and I know, I just know. And I know, I know those signs. I, I see it all and he doesn't... My husband always thinks that I'm just fibbing and I'm like, no, I'm telling you he's sick. And he says that I make him sick by saying it. I'm like, no, like I know. <laughs> um, but I remember just going in the ambulance and in that moment, like my son needed me, but I need. I remember, I remember that so distinctly. I needed my husband mm. and I'd never needed him before then. And I remember that moment when we opened up the ambulance and by then I'd already texted him and said, you need to get to the hospital. I'd open the ambulance and you know that thing that kids do when they're really sick and then suddenly they get better Yeah. when you take him to the doctor's <laughs> yes. where he did that. So they put a nebulizer on him, put right. some, give him some oxygen. He was fine. So he needed a bit of oxygen. Right. So, um, and he's suffered with asthma ever since, you know, he's, he has asthma now. So, you know, we struggle with his asthma when it gets hot, when it gets cold. So it's something that we're living with and he's living with and we, we're learning as we go along. But that was our first sign of having respiratory problems. Mm. So then you jumped into having a third. Yeah. When you said before it was when you, your second went to nursery. Yeah. And you're so like, oh. yeah. So Musa was four and Dawood was three, and oh, I say three. He was just turned. He just turned two actually okay. because there's only a three year gap between yeah. them. Yeah. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> Sooner than I thought. So he just turned two. So he was just going to sort of. Yeah, he hadn't even started nursery. He was in playgroup. Right. And I just remember just two felt like I don't know didn't too feel, easy too easy like, you see you're on three now see <laughs> you're on three and when I said I was pregnant with my third everyone said is it because you want a girl I was like no not necessarily That's so annoying that do comment, you get that yeah yeah, yeah yeah now if you have another child everyone's going to assume it's because you want a girl but yeah. maybe it's because you want a fourth child mm -hmm. but I remember have saying I'm pregnant and and I was like oh is it because you want a girl um I was like, no, I kind of just want, I just want three kids because there's like a seat free in my car and it makes sense to <laughs> fill it. I mean, if there was ever a reason to have a third child, yeah. that is it right there. I was like, there's a seat free. I reckon somebody should sit in it because it's wasted otherwise. I like to make the most of my money. <laughs> um, but then, but nobody tells you about how expensive it gets when you have a third child. Yeah. Um, we wait, wait, wait till you have to have a second hotel room that you never use. Well, there we go. Yeah. So now we book, because they don't do family rooms anymore, oh. so we have to book a second hotel room. But when we go on holiday, we want to all we all want to sleep in the same room together. Aww. So we have the most uncomfortable holidays <laughs> because we sleep in the bed and my daughter comes and piles up on top of us and the boys take the sofa, whatever it is that yeah. they're sleeping on. So we end up paying to be uncomfortable <laughs> wherever we go because they're scared because they don't want to sleep in a room away from us Aww. because it's creepy and they can hear crickets outside and things like that. So I was like, okay, so we've just had a third child and everything is more expensive. <laughs> and um, and turns out they get bigger and longer, which means you need a people carrier anyway. Yeah, yeah. So because you can't get, you actually physically can't get three, well, Isofix now is the main thing. You can't get three car seats next to each other in a car. No, you can't. Why did somebody not tell me this? Am I right in thinking that you uh, were studying and doing in a, a university degree while you were pregnant with her? Yeah, I was. I was doing... Because life wasn't, you know, difficult enough. Yes. And not enough going on. I think there was that point between having Dawood and having her where I just felt like, right, what am I doing? Because I've always wanted to go to university and mm. I didn't get to go to university. Um, and so I got married. And so that little gap, I kind of, there's always been that longing to finish my... To, to start at least, at least start my degree. And so with everything else going on, I thought, let's just add some more. Because I figured that once the kids are in bed, I could just study, couldn't yeah. I? And it was great, 
I mean, and, and I could, I could just put them to bed and, and I had this really good set routine with them. And as soon as I became, I started my course like a couple of months before I became pregnant. And then as soon as like the morning sickness, the workload became intense and then the morning sickness hit. Mm. And then I thought to myself, that's that moment when I thought, what on earth have I done? <laughs> that's that moment. And like, even after having fourth degree tear and then having a pregnancy straight after, I didn't think, what have I done? But yeah. in that moment, I remember feeling out of my depth, mm. thinking oh, maybe, maybe might have bitten off more than I can chew. And I remember saying, what on earth have I done? Yeah. And I remember when I said it out loud, my husband just said, the universe will hear you. You don't mean that. And I was like, no, I don't mean that. Sorry, universe, I didn't say that out loud. You know when you say it out yeah, loud, yeah, you yeah. think, oh my God. Take it oh, back, take it back, back, take it back. Yeah, so I was taking it back very quickly. And I was like, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I'm just, like, I'm really tired and I feel really sick. Yeah. And I remember revising for my exam while I was in labor with her. Really? Yeah, because I had an exam nine days after her, after having her. I had to, um, I had to um, do my exam, so I was Gosh. like revising. But luckily for me, my waters broke at home, mm -hmm. so I got to go home, and they broke at home, and then nothing was happening. So I got to come home for another twenty four hours. A bit more revising. Yeah, so I revised yeah. a little bit. <laughs> I washed my hair, nice. shaved my legs. Nice. You know, the, just I uh, oh, might as well prep. Did a bit of revision and then went back 24 hours later. They said, still nothing. And they said, so we're going to have to um, induce your labor, which had never happened. Again, I've had three completely yeah, different yeah. pregnancies, t totally different labors. And they said, you're measuring very small. So I was measuring something like 32. And okay. so very small. Yeah. And they weren't sure why. And, and they couldn't understand why she hadn't grown. And they said, she seems OK, but you're measuring very small. So it was a, it was a mystery right to the end. And then I remember going in and they said, right, we're going to have to induce you. I said, so before you induce me, could you perhaps give me an epidural? Mm. I said, like, because if, if we're going to plan this, let's just plan it so that I don't feel any pain whatsoever. And they said, yeah, we can do that. I was like, OK, let's do that then. So I just sat there, no contractions, <laughs> epidural. And then they induced me and then labor happened. And then she was born 20 something hours later. Right. Um, and, and she was the biggest of all of my kids. No. 8.14. She was massive. I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. She was just huge. And I remember looking and thinking, whoa, she, she, they, they told me that she'd be at most six pounds. No. Yeah. And she it's was, so funny how they can get it so wrong. Yeah, they can get it. I mean, that's why I just don't, I think nature and instinct, uh, that's something that has happened long before time and, and doctors and mm. medical um, technology. So I just think, I don't, I, it, I don't take it all as gospel. Yeah. You know what your body, you know your own body and you you can't predict what will happen to you and what won't happen. Yeah. So by that point, I'd given up trying to predict what's going to happen. It's whatever is there it has to come out. Let's just work it out. Um, and so I remember she, she was born at £8.14 and nothing, not one stitch. I did. She no. didn't tear me. I didn't need an episiotomy. She was the easiest. And I remember having her and and I said, weigh her fast because I need to know how much this child weighs. Oh, you've been really open about your panic disorder. Yeah. How, uh, how did you sort of, oh, I guess you can't really manage it, but did you, were you experiencing that through pregnancy as well? I you still have panic like, yeah. now, don't so you? So I've got panic disorder and um, and it's... One of those things I don't remember when I started having. So I've I've had it since I was seven, and, right. and it, I was diagnosed when I was eighteen. Um, I've been through the pregnancies. It was, I think, a lot of the thing. A lot of one thing that I do a lot to distract myself from the fact that I have panic disorder is distract myself. So mm. I will find other things to do, and 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 that 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 kind of manifests itself in. It could be cleaning the house or giving myself a project and saying, oh, well, I'll make this cake for this occasion. So I'll design it and I'll draw it and I'll get all the bits. And that's how I, that's kind of, that's how it manifested itself and baking. So whenever I had a couple of eggs left over, I was like, what recipe can I find where I could use these mm -hmm. two eggs? Because we didn't have very much. So we just kind of used what we had. And then, you know, in that process, I was kind of learning this new skill that I hadn't realized that I was honing in a, yeah. a decade later. Um, but I just used what I had and sometimes I look at the gas meter and think, oh my goodness, I haven't got any gas left. So can I bake anything today? Probably not because I haven't got enough money to put the money in the gas meter. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of really think about that stuff. And I think that's where 
when real life happened, somewhere, I think my panic disorder got put back where I just kind of back of my head where it was still there it would bubble up to the surface quite a lot but I had ways of managing it by distracting mm. myself so you know having the kids um and then giving myself different projects like just things like this today is the day that I'm going to use the most zoflora in the house and I will just like zoflora everything it's right. just really <laughs> weird kind of projects that I would give myself uh, and I'm going to make lip balm today I'm going to find the ingredients for a lip balm and that's what I'm going to make with like two pound fifty so I would give myself projects another thing that was me distracting myself yeah. um and cooking you know and making sure like I would cook from scratch for the kids I always have done and and it, those were my distractions but really I think it came to the fore when I had my little girl because at that point I was then juggling having three kids um living up north having very you know very little support in terms of looking after the kids. Mm. So I was on my own and my husband travelled a lot for work up until the point she was born. So he would go away and then come back and say, whoa, you got really pregnant suddenly. So he'd be gone for a few weeks and and we wouldn't see each other. So I was used to kind of holding the fort at home and if, if something needed decorating, I would do it. If something needed fixing, I would find ways of doing it on a very small budget. So I was always distracted by that. But um I remember when she was born and she was about six weeks old and it all kind of came to a head at that point because I'd suddenly had three very small kids, you know, one that was at nursery, one that was, you know, one that was going to full-time nursery, one that was going part-time and then we had a baby and then I was kind of trying to, I was kind of managing myself and trying to go, like when I'd see snow, I'm like, well, how am I supposed to get these three kids out in the snow? And I remember my son's first day at nursery and I kind of carrying Mariam in my arms and it's like she's snow collecting up into a little hood because oh. she couldn't move. She was a baby. So yeah. she had like, the snow just gathered in her hood. And by the time I got her home, she had like this melted snow all down her oh. chest and this little cough. And oh, I was like, no. oh no, that was me. I did that. Do you know, and I, and, and it was just like trying to juggle everything at the same yeah. time and looking after the house and then studying. So because I so desperately wanted to be more than just a mum, I wanted my kids to see me work. So mm. there was that. And and so I think it came to a head and I got to a point where I was having a panic attack every single day. Really? Every day. Like up to this point, I was probably having a panic attack every few months. Mm-hmm. So I was, ex- you almost like, ex- when you have panic disorder, you, ex- you part of having panic disorder is waiting for it to happen, is waiting for living in fear of that panic attack. Well, you almost get anxiety over the fact that you're going to have a panic attack. Yeah, so so you're, it's a never-ending circle. Yeah. So you have it and then you're like, okay, so I've had it now. Now I have to worry about the next time that I have it and what situation I'm going to be in and who's going to see me and how can I hide and how do we, how do you, because when you, when you on the outside look like you've got it together, you've got three kids and you're managing your wife, you're managing your husband and your home and, and dealing with all of that, then suddenly you say oh I've got panic disorder at the same time you look you to on the outside you'll appear weak and I think that's what I thought is that what you found really difficult to like sort of telling people about it I I never spoke to anyone about it I mean to the point where I didn't even tell my husband that I had it till after we got married Mm. and then he worked out that something wasn't right and then I said well I have panic disorder and he didn't know what that meant till really after we had kids and and it started to it, it kind of manifested itself differently after having kids I was having more I was um I was fainting more and I was passing out. And um, did it worry you about having the kids? And you know, if you're on your own with the kids and you had a had a had a panic attack. Yeah. Well, what happened was when what I used to do was when I know it's there, I could feel it bubbling away. And even now, when when I know it's there, I have to. I mean, I last night was a real because today's my first kind of full day back out. Right. So I was really nervous about coming back out because there's like there's that fear that you have to look perfect and mm. that scares me a little bit. Um, and and, and it, I, even just yesterday it was bubbling away, but it used to bubble away and I could feel it on the surface, but it's your mind and your body is a clever thing and, and f- for some reason, my I knew that I did not want to fall apart in front of the kids, so I would get them all to bed and you know when they're like really small? Mm. You can tell them it's bedtime at six o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and say, so, yep, it's bedtime. And they can't tell the time. So you're yeah. like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's bedtime. And then I had Iggle Piggle recorded like in the night garden. I used to, because he used to be the last thing that was on CBBS yeah. before bedtime. So I had, his, so I recorded <laughs> him. On. I recorded him. And then I put him on. And, and then my son would say, I haven't got my pajamas on. He would run and get his pajamas on. And he'd be like, okay. So, and he would sing the little song. And then he'd say, night, night. 
and then he'd go up to bed. Aww. But I knew that it was bubbling away on the yeah. surface, so I would get him up to bed. And I, I, I hate that because when I, when I, just admitting that makes me sad because I know, like I lost, how, I know how many hours I lost with my kids because of my panic disorder. Mm. Um, but so because I didn't want them to see me that way. But what would have been the worst thing that would have happened if they had seen yeah. me? Like they would have just seen mum vulnerable, and that's okay. It's okay to see mum not together all the time is that a large sort of is that what encourages you to talk about it now so that other mums in that position don't lose those hours absolutely because I I, I I if I count the amount of hours I lost with my kids because I was so desperate for them not to see me fall apart yeah then I I can't I can't get those hours back you know I'll never have those hours back where I put my kids away to bed knowing that they're happy and asleep in bed and I would sit there and crumble and fall apart. And I don't even know why sometimes. I would just, like, I'd, f- I'd be a mess. And I'd fall apart. And, and I would feel like, as a mum, I'd done the best thing by not letting them see me fall apart. Mm. And actually, what I did wasn't a good thing. I don't think, for me, was a good thing. Because now, I've had to explain panic disorder to my children. And... And I'm being completely honest in saying that my kids have seen me have a panic attack and they have seen me fall apart. But that's okay. Yeah. It's okay to... Mum does not have to be the strongest woman in the world. Mum mm-hmm. does not have to be a robot. Mum does not have to be perfect. Mum can be human. Mm-hmm. And I think we don't give ourselves enough credit to allow ourselves to be human. Yeah. And I think that's... I think I did a discredit to my children by not allowing them to see me as a human being for such a long time. I operated like a robot. I wanted them to be perfect and I wanted their lives to be perfect and I wanted them to see the perfect mum. And actually, sometimes allowing yourself to let your kids see your imperfections means that they will be open to talk to you. They'll op- Now, when I'm having a panic attack and I know it's there and I'm just... I'll say to my kids, like my my older two are now old enough to understand. We have this code. I say I'm on holiday, which means that I'm on my period. Right. So I'm feeling a little <laughs> bit cranky today. Holiday means I'm eating chocolate. I'm in my pajamas <laughs> and we're chilling out. That's what we're doing. So I'm like, mommy's on holiday. And sometimes my 11 year old come up to me and say, mommy, are you on holiday? Because of the way I'm dressed, perhaps, or maybe right. just not doing very much around mm-hmm. the house. And I'm like, no. And he goes, you're not feeling happy today. And I was like, no. And he goes, right, so what can we do to make you happy? And so they'll do silly things to try and make me happy. But I always tell them, whenever I'm feeling really down and I'm not, I'm struggling, I always tell them that they're not the, they make me happy. They are my happiness. Mm. They're not the reason, you know? And I think sometimes, because a couple of times my son said, don't we make you happy? And I said, my panic disorder has got nothing to do with you. I'm sick. They're, they're two very different things. You know, you make me happy. You're the reason why I'm still here today. Um, you make me happy. That's why I'm here. But my panic disorder, I always explain to them that it's an illness. It's not me. It's Being sad is an illness. You can have, you know, mm. that, that, that's how it manifests itself. But I say, mommy's sick. You know, mommy, mommy doesn't always, sometimes I can't control how I feel. And, um, and, and I feel anxious and I can't, sometimes I can't get out of bed and, and and they they just sometimes if I'm in bed and I'm a, in bed a little bit longer than usual they know maybe she's not having a good day and they will literally make a cup of tea put it on the side give oh. me a kiss and just walk out they know when it's right not to say something but sometimes they know that they should say something and and I always say it's okay to say whatever you want I'm mm. never angry with you it's just sometimes it's like if I have a headache I want to sometimes have a paracetamol so sometimes this you guys are my medicine yeah. so. They do things to distract me other times they don't, but they understand it better. And they have seen me fall apart and they know mommy's not perfect. Mm. And that's that's really important. And I always, um, I, I remember my, my my 11-year-old now, when he was four, he said, mommy, mans don't cry. And I said, no, mans do cry. Mm-hmm. Mans do cry. Who told you mans don't cry? And he said, this boy in nursery said that mans don't cry. I said, mans do cry. If you want to cry, you can cry. And now... Like they cry whenever they're upset and they we have this thing in our house. We have the step. So it's not the naughty step. No, no. It's the step at the top of our uh, landing. And if you're feeling sad and sometimes you don't want to talk about it and you're not sure how to talk about it, you just sit on that step and somebody will come. And that's what we do now. So whenever I'm feeling a little bit sad and not feeling okay, I sit on the top of that step. Right. And they just know. They're like, mommy's, mommy's just a little bit sad. And we just have a little 
we have a little huddle and we have a little chat and we have had some of the best conversations on that landing because that's the place where it's where you get to say I, I'm okay I'm not okay but I can't say it out loud and and that's what we do now so whenever my son whenever the kids are upset you know at the moment like I've got a my my eldest is nearly a teenager so he has moments where he he spends a lot of time on that landing mm. but he sits on the step and it's for the it's there for dad too so you know whenever he's feeling a little bit sad he just sits there on the step and we just have this thing and now sometimes because we said it's okay to not want to talk about something yeah. but it's okay to but you have to tell us that you're not okay so how do we talk about it without talking about it and so we use the step it's amazing that you found a way of opening up such huge conversations mm. when like you were saying in your culture, certain conversations just aren't had. No. Is that a real conscious thing? You want to be able to talk about emotion, about what's going on, you know, mentally, any like anything that's going on, just have that conversation out there. It's a constant battle because I am con- I feel like I'm always swimming against the tide. Right. Um, growing up in the culture that I did, you know, there, there are certain things. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a massive... There's this thing, it's respect, but it's slightly misplaced. It's like respect is I, I kind of don't like that word because there's a mutual respect, but there's respect for the sake of respect. And I think that word is used wrong. Um, mm. And I think things like not talking about your periods, not talking about sex, not talking about being pregnant, um, even down to things like you can't even say your husband's name. For Whereas it feels like you have so much respect for your kids that it's not, it's not equal because obviously you are their mother. But yeah. there's a respect there. That you want that openness. It's mutual. And yeah. I think there's a difference between hierarchy and just saying actually we I, I do respect my kids and I and, and and because I always for me they are kids and I'm raising them and I always remind them remember who pays the bills <laughs> um, but we are we're a team and we always call, we I always call ourselves that we say we're a team because if you ask my eight-year-old what's her favorite job to do in the house she'll tell you it's to clean the toilets really yeah and they all have jobs in your house don't they? yeah well it's I always say that this is our home and we all, it's, it's because it's a home doesn't mean we don't respect this home. This is yeah. our house. We live in it and we love it because we, this is our safe place. This is the only place in the world that we're going to feel safe. It's the only place I feel safe. It's the only place my kids will ever feel safe. And that's what home is about. Home mm. is the place where you kick your shoes back and say, this is mine. And, and, and this is theirs and it's mine and we share it. And so they have jobs in the house and, 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 you know, when we have dinner, we all, put dinner on the table. I cook it. My husband's an awful cook. So, really? You know, oh, God, no. I can imagine food being really important in your house as well. Yeah, we just, like, the kids are great cooks. Like, if I need something cooking, I just get, go to the kids and I just, I just put a post-it note and they come back from school and they'll cook dinner. No! Yeah, yeah. So my eldest can do, like, a bolognese or a pesto or something quick. Yeah. Um, he could do a mean chicken curry. He could really? do a really good chicken curry, yeah. So if I just put a post-it note and say, could you just cook this? He will just cook it up. And occasionally I come away from it and I realise how much I depend on them to feel comfortable and and vice versa so you know and I know they're gonna we've got a big world to let them out into so it's quite scary to think yeah Yeah. it just sounds like you're doing such an amazing job that I literally feel like I could take things that you do away and try them in my house like I I, and, and you know we speak to a lot of people on here yeah and I just think some of your ways of doing stuff are just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, that, it's one of those things, isn't it? We don't know whether we're doing, there's no right or wrong answer, no, really, there isn't. is there? But it, that's what, the, I think it's listening to different people and, oh, well, that, your house works in that, you know, in that way. And I think that's what's so interesting about these these episodes and these the, this podcast is that it's just getting those conversations out there and, and, and seeing actually we don't need to fall into the same traps that our parents fell into yeah. or follow certain cultures just because that is what it, you know everyone else has done before us. Yeah. Actually, finding our own way and adapting things, there's something really beautiful yeah. in that. I think as mums, I think it's important for our kids to see that we're human too mm. and we're not perfect and we're going to crumble a little bit occasionally. So, yeah. and, it's, and the pressure we put on ourselves as mums, just as groups of mums, we put so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect and I just, it's not fair and we shouldn't, we don't, we don't need to be. No. No, not at all. So we finished every podcast episode yep. with you finishing three sentences. Okay. It's very simple. Okay. Being a mum means. Oh, being a mum means, does anybody ever give you like one simp, like, no, no never. <laughs> uh, I think I have had everything once. Just, just Really? That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh 
oh god i don't know what does being a mum mean oh my god it means you've got every member being a mum means that you've got enough players for a really good board game <laughs> Very true. I love a good board game. <laughs> you can't just do it with you and your husband, can you? No, it is no, hard. It's it difficult. is really hard. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, since having children, I, uh, I think I, f- I think I found my calling. Yeah. And I'm happy when. Oh, well, uh, I'm happy when when I got fluffy socks on and the kids are in bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I'm happy. Beautiful. Yay! Thank you so much for coming on and being a lovely guest. Thank you very much. This podcast was brought to you by Fisher-Price. Fisher-Price recognises that every child is unique and in developing toys that are filled with imagination and excitement help little ones to grow as they're introduced to the world around them.